This discussion of Don Calloway was originally targeted at uh, the local community, although it may also interest visitors to Don Calloway, the Brock, and students or others interested in Brocks in general, or perhaps in Don Calloway in particular. Our principal focus will be on how to read the monument and how that reading then can lead to useful insights on the social context of the original Early Iron Age and secondary Middle Iron Age uses of the Brock. The Iron Age is the last of the traditional three ages of humanity, the Stone, Bronze and Iron Ages. And the Iron Age is, for the purposes of this talk, divided into three sub-periods, the Early, Middle and Late. We'll focus mainly on the Early and Middle, which covers the span from 700 uh, to BC to 200 AD. I will assert that Brocks are built in the fourth century BC, but that the Brock villages of the East Coast and Northern Isles are symbolized by the Brock pottery, uh, Brock period pottery from Dun Carloway and date to the interval 200 BC to 200 AD. And these are essentially our primary and secondary periods. When the masonry of the Brock was first built, we refer to the monuments in that state as um, the primary <clears throat> as a prim primary monument. And the next slide. Next slide. Uh, and the next slide shows how I think that Brock looked. Um, <clears throat> I will return to this drawing again and again because it's my view of um, what Brock's looked like based on the evidence that's available from the 80 or so Brock uh, remains that present uh, elements of the original structure when that's visible even. Now, next slide, please. This is how um, Don Carloway looked on the left in 1928 and on the right as it now looks. As we shall later see, Brocks were extensively remodeled and in some instances, especially on the Eastern coast and the Northern Isles, completely new arrangements were built into the Brock masonry, as well as being built inside the monument, around it and over it. All of these adaptations, repairs and rebuilds, etc., give rise to secondary versions of the monument. Next slide, please. Dry stone building means building without the use of clay or mortar or cement or any other form of adhesive material to hold the monument's stones in place. Obviously, it is easier to build dry stone walls from flat slab-like or tabular stones uh, illustrated in the left-hand image here, and more difficult, though certainly not impossible, to build with harder rock types that break in angular fragments uh, and require a lot of small stones uh, used as pinnings uh, to fill the spaces between the larger stones. Slabby stone is mainly quarried from sedimentary rock types which have been laid down and conveniently in layers, while the hard rock types are mainly volcanic plutonic or metamorphic rock types, of which Lewisian gneiss uh, is the dominant rock type in the Hebrides. In the talk, I'll distinguish between hard rock rocks, uh, which is a bit of a tongue twister, and sedimentary rocks, um, and hopefully you'll see why that's significant later. Next slide, please. This is the original Brock Tower, I argue which was a tall dry stone built tower consisting of two walls, outer and inner, pinned together or kept apart by the stone slab floors of a sequence of galleries superimposed on each other uh, vertically, which can be seen uh, in the illustration here, numbered 19 to 21. The two are in exceptional cases, three lowest galleries have smooth or fa fair internal wall faces. But above this, the walls of the galleries are very roughly finished. Their roughness and progressive narrowing means that the upper galleries are not and were never meant to be readily accessible. This is in general my 
revised model of the Brock Tower. Next slide, please. Brocks can be found in the Hebrides, in mainland Scotland, concentrated in the Northeast and in the Northern Isles. Further south, a scattering of central uh, of rocks can be found in central and southern Scotland, but these are generally anomalous and in practice very few. I'm slightly colorblind, so if anybody has questions arising from the distribution map, I am definitely not the person to ask. Um, next slide, please. The space between the inner and outer walls is, as I've said, subdivided vertically into a number of galleries. There are at least four and more probably five galleries in Duncalloway, which is similar in size to the more extensively preserved Brock at Duntel, which I show on the left here. Note that the space between the walls narrows with height, as, as I've said, uh, more clearly so in the Duncalloway image, which is slightly surprising given that the inner wall there unusually leans inward. Inner walls are usually vertical or were clearly intended to be vertical and their distortions now are due to the, the tax that time levies on us all. Next slide, please. The narrowing of the gallery space at Duntelv is clearly visible in the photograph on the left. And on the right, I repeat this standard revised model uh, or revised standard model image to make the point that the outer wall as it is built, as it was built originally, was constructed leaning, yeah, apparently leaning inwards. In fact, the separate stones are perfectly horizontal, but the wall face inclines inward. Uh, and walls of this type are said to be battered. I believe that most of Brock walls were battered at one in six, which means to say that for every six units you go up, you, the wall goes in one unit. But the reality is that most Brock walls are so badly damaged that slopes of one to six up to one to 10, and in one case, a little bit more, uh, can be found within a single monument. And the reasons why have to do with the ways in which the walls collapsed and surviving fragments are pushed out on two sides and pulled in on uh, the sides at the, along an axis at right angles to that first one. I have argued that the walls were finished, as we can see in the Glenelg monuments, in linear fashion, so that the shape of the brock is the shape of a truncated cone. It's a cone with the top cut off. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the Brock of Musa in Shetland is the most photogenic of the Brocks, seeming near complete. However, it is also one of the most misleading Brocks. It has a helical staircase, sometimes called a spiral staircase, uh, running up to from the ground, from near the ground to the wall head. And it has a carved or recarved outer wall. But you can actually, well, I'll come back to that in a moment. Many people believe that the possession of a helical stairway and a recurved outer wall is um, a diagnostic feature of all brocks, that it is typical of all brocks. In fact, it neither feature is typical at all. In 1981, Noel Foyt wrote a paper entitled, Is Musa a Brock? And he concluded that Musa is a brock but no other Brock is a Musa. And I and many others agree with him. No other Brock has a helical stairway and only badly damaged Brocks have the distorted shapes of Musa's outer wall. But even in these photographs, you can see that the walls have different profiles on different sides of the monument. And in the next slide, please, you can see that more clearly, that there are stark differences uh, all around the wall of the Brock. These are the product of damage and distortion to the masonry. They are not a design feature. The most common form selected is one of the two on the right. Next slide. Returning to Duncalloway, we can say that whilst preserving its linear sides, allowing for some slight flattening and some kinks in the wall line overlooking the steep fall away to the southeast, which is on the left of these illustrations, uh, the walls are nonetheless um, linear in their 
form as they arise at Dun Calloway was a truncated cone in its uh, external form. There is evidence within the Brock masonry for a probably lengthy sequence of collapses and failures. And finding those uh, masonry features and making sense of them is something of a challenge. Here I will look only at the main features, but I hope that some of you might be encouraged to go and look for yourselves. And I would certainly be interested to hear about any more that you see. Next slide, please. These lintels form the floors of the uppermost galleries and they are distorted and displaced. They have been on the, out, on the left hand side, which is the outer side, uh, or towards the outer side of the brock. The lintels have been pulled down and they've also been rotated uh, clockwise uh, slightly. Uh, for that to have happened, there has to have been a significant movement of the outer wall face. You can see the movement is significant enough to bend, break and displace uh, lintels, even in the lower galleries. Next slide, please. This uh, illustration from the 19th century shows the inner wall, uh, the, yes, the inner face of the, of the outer wall and it shows you the lines of um, the gallery floors. You can see immediately that there are at least two arrangements embodied here. It would have been impossible to ascend the second stairway, given that there's a stone floor closing it off at the top right. I'm not convinced totally by my division into phases here, but something like this must have applied. Next slide, please. The stairway, which currently gives access from ground to the first gallery level, displays at least four rebuilds, which have been caused, I think, by failure and partial rebuilding of the outer wall, because the outer edges of the steps have been pulled down and out. They've been twisted and fractured, and they've been pulled out of their original setting within the inner wall, which is on the right in the third image from the left there. Uh, um, and they point to a gross um, um, disarticulation caused by a significant force like the movement of the outer wall. Next slide. The outer wall, if it had never been uh, damaged and if it showed a smooth and regularly built masonry would raise question marks over my suggestion that there has been significant damage here. The difficulty is that we cannot rely on patterns in masonry to deduce masonry history. But the thing we can say about this appearance of the outer wall is that it is not consistent with a single constant build. It doesn't demonstrate that there have been other builds, but I am convinced by it that there have been more than one failure in the wall foot here on the slope edge. Uh, and, and that gives us this pattern of um, of recurring build lines. Next slide, please. And I'm going to turn to something that are called stacked voids. Um, these are the, the uh, areas of the ladder-like structures that are found either just over the entrances to cells within the wall thickness, which you see along the bottom here, which is from uh, Musa, or they extend all the way from the floor to the top of the wall head as it survives on the left in one of the, in Duntelv and on the right in Musa. Um, the Brock has been overbuilt above the heads of the stacked voids. The simple purpose of a stacked void is to remove the pressure on the center of the lintel over a passageway. Stone is not at its strongest in that configuration and weight on the middle of the stone will nine times out of 10 break it. These sort of arrangements um, pr protect the lintels. But of course, you only need to do it once or twice or three or four times uh, to achieve that effect. And therefore, we can say that the long stacked boys are an architectural choice, a cognitive choice uh, undertaken by the builders of the brocks. Next slide, please. This is Mackenzie's illustration of 1792, which shows uh, remnants of two stacked voids in Dun Carloway. Uh, 
and on the right, uh, a view of how it now survives. The next slide, I've taken uh, an arrow from the top of the cell entrance in the photograph to the corresponding um, cell entrance in Mackenzie's illustration, just to help you locate yourself. It seems clear that the surviving fragment of stacked void in the Brock uh, is that illustrated, is the right hand one of the two illustrated by Mackenzie. There's no sign of the left hand one. And we have to assume that it has been uh, partly uh, removed by destruction, as indeed has part of the right, uh, the surviving one, uh, but has been, what remained of it has been um, filled in with masonry. Next slide. Even over the cell entrances in Don Carloway, there were stacked void arrays, at least two on the left hand top. Uh, at least one in the middle, probably two, and at least one on the right hand side. The blue rectangles show where the um, voids would have been. The bottom three photographs show how the configuration as it now is. And just to convince you that I'm not making it up, I've included a picture from the Royal Commission's 1928 inventory, which shows the middle of the three on the bottom row to its left, now completely blocked up. These infillings are not the work of God and geology. Um, they're probably caused by well-intentioned, but perhaps misguided maintenance. In summary, it is clear therefore that Duncanway Monument as we see it is in a fragmented, highly altered and definitely secondary state. But as we can also see, it retains sufficient of its original form and of the configuration of canonical Brock parts for us to be happy that this was a Brock Tower and a Brock Tower of the form I've called the RSM, which we've already seen. And I want to turn to um, the issue of primary and secondary monuments and primary and secondary tectonics. And firstly, let me say that the idea of art architectural tectonics has a variety of meanings, but they all relate to the use of the structure for its intended purpose in the interaction between its physical structure and the metaphysics and tensions, thoughts and ideas of its users. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn to church architecture to give you some examples of this. On the left hand side, you can see evidence for the spoliation and cultural appropriation of the temple of Athena at Syracuse in Sicily. It was first built in about 480 BC, and it was culturally appropriated and transformed to a Christian church in the seventh century, then to a mosque in AD 878 and back to a church in 1085 or thereabouts. Its conversion to a church entailed cutting significant piercings in the cella walls. The cella is the Holy of Holies, a separate structure within the uh, temple. And the columns on the outside had the gaps between them infilled with masonry curtain walls, each of which in the image on the left, you can see contains a little Romanesque uh, window. Ex excavations in between 1907 and 1910 by Paolo Orsi revealed earlier temples, altars and shrines underlying the Athena temple. We could argue that in this case, the tectonics of the structure were preserved over the entire period of its uh, of its lifespan and through all of its structural modifications. They were the tectonics of a place of worship, even if the specifics of the rites of worship changed and required alteration in the detailing of the structure. The right hand image here, conversely, shows a kirk being subsumed within a trendy block of modern flats. And it is very unlikely that its original tectonics, as related to the services and rites previously conducted in it, could still be undertaken in its new form. The surviving masonry has not undergone much change, but it's equally clear that this is not a kirk. It has lost its primary tectonics. By analogy, if a brock has been repaired or even partly rebuilt, in the form of and with the characteristics of the primary brock, then it remains a brock. 
that's its cultural context. At Clacktal, next slide, we removed about 300 tons of masonry, uh, masonry rubble from inside the brock, revealing the stack point above the entrance, which is over to the left there where somebody's hung his coat. Um, there's a stacked void, which is infilled with flat slabs above the cell entrance to the right. And there are two other stacked voids uh, in, the, um, in the surviving remains. In, its, in the configuration in which it survives to us, the Brock, and this is, as it were, pre the um, late first century BC occupation, reoccupation, um, <clears throat> the Brock had been reduced to this about one and a half story structure, and was probably to some extent refashioned in that. It didn't, it didn't fall accidentally to one and a half stories part of it had been higher and parts of it had been certainly lower. The latter have been rebuilt and the former have been knocked down to achieve a one and a half story platform. The occupation evidence from the floor of the Brock, you can see some of the, the black charcoal staining still there, although it's all been removed in that picture. Uh, all of the set, all of the charcoal remains on the floor and all of the settlement evidence on the floor uh, have dated to about three centuries later than the building of the Brock, we argue. Although Brock-like in its final form, it's arguably no longer a Brock in this form. That said, and despite the severe damage and some remodeling, it retains evidence of all of the significant characteristics of the canonical RSM form of Brock. Next slide, please. Chris Abraham um, excavated chamber A in the nine o'clock position in this Brock. And he found the type of pottery which is illustrated here, which he did not expect to find because he believed that it comes too late in the pottery sequence for Brocks. However, it is remarkably similar to the pottery from Clactal, and for that matter, uh, to pottery recovered by my own excavations at Balashir and at other coastal sites in the US, and indeed at the many East Coast and Northern Islands brocks. This is a brock type pottery. And Clacton, the pottery uh, lies in soft sediments, mainly peat ash under the buried burnt remains of a rather ephemeral structure. These sediments were, as I've said, all later than all of the Brock building and rebuilding of which there is abundant evidence. The sediments dated to the interval 50 BC to 1 AD and very probably to a short interval within that interval, within that period. It is possible that Duncarloway was already ruinous when the Middle Iron Age settlement represented by this pottery assemblage was deposited in wall cell A. In this, it mirrors the evidence from Clacton, albeit that the latter having burnt down in that 50 BC 1 AD interval, preserves a larger and wider assemblage of pottery and other material evidence. I will therefore argue that this final iteration of Duncarloway had experienced an early history of collapse and rebuilding within the primary Brock tectonics. And I suggest that based on the pottery assemblage, it was like Clactol reoccupied in or about the first century BC. This pottery assemblage, small though it is, is valuable for Carloway because there's precious little else. The material that you saw filling the base of the Brock in some in the earlier illustrations, in 19th century illustrations, was all shoveled out and all of their contents lost. Abraham, as I said, uh, argued that it must be late in the development sequence of rocks in the area, and he was, I think, prescient in that belief. Now, I'm going to depart from uh, Duncarloway for a moment and turn to some of the northeastern and northern rocks of which I've spoken. Um, next slide, please, shows. Um, Gurness, 
And the main point, one of the main points I want to, to show you here is that these blocks on the East Coast and in the Northern Lines have often been built up inside or completely built over with later houses. Uh, this shows the brock at Garness heavily, in, oh, can you show the next slide, please? This shows the brock at Garness heavily encumbered with secondary buildings that surround it. Um, and the brock and those buildings were all subsumed within their own domestic refuse and the structures and refuse of later buildings which, were, which arose above them. The next slide shows a laser scan of the same monument. And you can probably see here these yellow lines introduce you to the feature that above the entrance to the primary brock at the then current and cut into the then current wall head, a cellular building has been constructed. Two thirds of which it would, if we were to rebuild it now, would project out into open air, uh, demonstrating the point, I guess, that not only was the inside of the block uh, infilled more or less to wall, height, wall head height, but the ground level outside had risen to a similar height. Next slide shows the block at Midhoe. Um, and there are a couple of points I want to make about that. It's similarly cluttered with buildings constructed around it. And this is one of several rocks that were progressively infilled with rubble. So at the entrance, at, the, at its entrance, when the floor inside and presumably the ground level outside also had risen to the point where entrance was difficult, um, a new hole was made in the outer wall above the original one and a new entrance was uh, slapped through the masonry uh, using the original entrance lintels as floor slabs for a new entrance into the brock. We have to imagine this brock progressively filling up and with material uh, alterations uh, to its internal configuration to accommodate that in filling. On the right hand side here, is uh, from a laser scan and the word access points to an entrance and near the bottom, just left to the bottom center of the illustration. And that was the, that entrance, no entrance was once part of a stacked void. It was refashioned when a roundhouse was built about here above the surviving wall head. These people discovered the stairwell coming down here, followed it down and created a souterrain on the over to the right of that entrance um, in, the mace, in the fallen masonry. The vertical slabs that divide the brock in two, which you can see on both sides, um, are more than three meters high. But I'd just like to point out to you that the, there is a little structure like a telephone box at the right hand end of, the, of that septum divide. Um, and on top of it, which you can see in the scan, there's a stone slab, which was found to be a hearth slab, a hearth stone, a fire had been lit on top of it, indicating a very much higher floor level at that stage. Next slide, please. A great deal more of the structures has been removed around uh, this monument than at Garnet, but that's probably because it was excavated by a gardener who took a fairly robust view on what should stay and what should go. Next slide, please. Here's the uh, slab uh, at the right-hand end of the internal uh, dividing walls uh, to make the point. And if you're gifted with the eyesight of eagles, you may be able to see some of the broken original lentils, lintels, uh, it's not a vegetarian monument, in the side wall of the entrance passage on the right-hand side of, the, of this illustration. Next slide, please. This slide is out of focus, uh, which is my fault, um, and I apologize for it, but you can still see between those two uh, contiguous arrows, uh, the inner face of the Brock Wall at a site called the Cairns, which is under excavation by Martin Carruthers. However, over the rest of where the interior must be, you can see first infilling of the interior and then the construction of round houses, D-shaped houses, 
uh, towards the right rectangular houses, probably of north of North State. And interestingly, the left hand of the two adjoining arrows points to the Brock entrance, which runs out here. Similarly, this was rediscovered, tunneled through, and a souterrain was constructed in the rubble outside and to the right of the original entrance here. Now, before I finish consideration of Black of Clacton, next slide, please. This is an illustration of how we think Clacton Brock appeared at the end of the first century BC, reduced to about one and a half stories and fitted out with an internal structure, principally of posts and wattle screens. There is no evidence for in situ structural posts or beams, apart from the proliferation of carbonized wattles on the garth floor and a small number of larger carbonized pieces. Believing that no sensible Iron Age builder would put a continuous roof over an already dark cylindrical space, I have conjectured a clerestory uh, at the top under the roof cap. And uh, this could have contained uh, window opes that could be closed with wattle screens. Uh, closed and opened by the use of ropes uh, from the floor of the brock inside. That would have provided light, um, a principal requirement of, of life everywhere, and, um, and allowed for some ventilation as well. However, I want you to note that there is no evidence to support this reconstruction any more than there is any evidence to support the conical Chinese hats of the prevailing interpretation, which would have created a very dark interior and smoky. I believe that it's probable that Dun Calloway looked something like this in its final Middle Iron Age years. Next slide, please. Right, this is the landscaper immediately around Dun Calloway, but before discussing this, let me say, rehearse for you what my purpose was in showing you images of Arcadian Brocks. Firstly, I wanted to impress on you that the probability of a 2000 year old dry stone built structure surviving intact and unaltered to our times is nil. There is no possibility that that has ever happened. Ian Tate of UHI Orkney has written a wonderful paper that asks what use are Brocks? And he answers it with a historical analysis of the many uses to which they have been put in Orkney in the historical past. A giant heap of quarried stone is a valuable resource, so much so that rental on some farms in Orkney cost more if the farm had a Brock on it. This indicates the planned reuse of Brock stone for everyday farming, construction, including homes, shelters, walls, pens, and so on. The commissioners of Northern Lights use Brock stones to build and repair some of their beacons and signals. Second World War coastal concrete pillboxes were built on top of Brock's. Fortunately, and so on and so on, the, the list is almost, <coughs> excuse me, the list is almost endless. Fortunately for us, careful examination even of these Brock's can reveal some or all of their original form as well as their final states. And I hope that you have seen that this is the case with Don Calloway. Secondly, I wanted to note that although massive structures, Western Brocks and those of, Shet of the Shetland Brocks that are built from hard rock material are about 20% smaller than their Eastern coast and Northern brother. If we calculate the amount of energy it takes to quarry transport and lift into building uh, the stone for these Brocks, we discover that it costs pretty much exactly to within two or 3%, the same amount of energy to build the bigger East Coast and Northern Brocks and the 20% smaller West Coast Brocks. They therefore represent the same sort of social investment of social treasure, which at that time would have been people and energy and the resources necessary to keep the people going. And thirdly, in Ray, the East Coast Brocks, I think we should note the fact that setting aside minor quibbles, there are no Brock villages in the west of the Hebrides of the sort seen in the east and the Orkneys and parts of Shetland. I have referred to the canonical Brock form that spread over the whole of the Brock territory, the entire area in which we now find Brock remains. <clears throat> 
They are, once the secondary accretions are in imagination removed, they are quite standard buildings. This implies to me that their cultural milieu is quite consistent over the whole in the fourth century BC. In other words, it was the same cultural province, West Coast, North Mainland and Northern Isles and Western Isles were all part of the same cultural context. <coughs> in the final century or two BC, Rock sites were reused more extensively in the east of Scotland and in the Northern Isles as centres for village-like settlements that did not find expression in the West. I believe that this reflects a difference in cultural milieu and a difference in cultural context between the two areas at this later date. There are about 600 brocks which in their primary form I see as aggrandized homes of wealthy farmers who were perhaps also clan leaders for their extended families and perhaps for some subservient client families also. In the east where land is more fertile, fertile and arable land is more extensive, it became possible for societies to aggregate and to develop stronger agricultural economies. They became somewhat more metropolitan and their social pyramid could accommodate merchants and professional classes uh, who found homes in the bases, around the bases of the newly reoccupied brock remains uh, from which they could work and from which they could develop their markets. Ewan Mackay in this respect has noted the relative archaeological wealth of the eastern and northern brocks and the clearly much lower levels of artifactual wealth in the West and South. Now, as this slide illustrates, the land in the West is in smaller patches and generally of poorer quality than you find on mainland and, and certainly on, on, uh, in the Orkneys. And villages did not arise in the West, I think, and in the West Highlands in the late Iron Age because the areas of arable land could not in general support multiple families. Alex Wolfe and James Fraser uh, two of Scotland's leading early medieval historians, they paid me to say that, um, that's not true. Um, they call this Western sort of social order farmers republics and argue that these were still clearly in existence even under the kingship of Rida, the Pictish king of the sixth century. And similar uh, social systems existed in the West of Norway all, also for perhaps even 400 years longer. In the West Highlands and the Hebrides, small homestead groups, probably under familial leadership, survived and emerged as the clan system through the high medieval period and into the clearance period in the Highlands and Islands. But I think their roots are to be found in the landscapes of the primary brocks. Next slide, please. And you'll be pleased to know I'm almost done. I found this image of a rather beautiful Louis Schoch lady, which I include here to remind us that the Iron Age was not populated by refugees from dungeons or dragons, but by normal human beings like you and me. The past does not deserve the condescension implicit in models that exaggerate its status or demean it with a faint praise of its technically competencies. The past merits our respect for its role in conserving humanity. And it is entitled in return, I believe, to expect from that humanity our conservation of the physical remains of the heritage it has passed on to us. Rocks are a significant part of the universal patrimony of humanity, not just Scotland's unique key monument. And I hope that our continuing interest in, these conser in their conservation for this and future generations will prevail over the forces of time and ignorance that continue to erode them. Thank you.